Do you know what this is? No, it isn't a model of a flying saucer or a spaceship. But it is an accurate model of the principal carrier in the most amazing transportation system ever devised. It's a red blood cell. Hey guys, so I hope you actually did watch that video yesterday. I know you're probably thinking, what in the world is Mr. Eversole thinking sending us this old outdated video from the 1950s? Why in the world would he do that? And to be honest, because I like those kind of videos. I like those old science videos for whatever reason. But I also sent it to you because it had really good information in it that I want you to look at and really start to consider about what we're going to be talking about this week. The video itself discussed not only the blood, but it also discussed the heart, how they work together, how they were designed for a unique purpose, and how they fulfill that purpose. And I just kind of wanted you to have that in your head as we go through it this week, how we talk about our blood, what its function is, what it does, and our heart, and how basically without these structures, how we wouldn't be able to function at all. And so today what we're going to focus on is just our blood alone. And we're going to look at what our blood does, why is it important, what makes it our blood, how do we classify it as blood, and stuff like that. So without further ado, let's just go ahead and let's get right into it. So blood itself is actually considered a type of connective tissue. Now, a lot of people might try and think that it's a connective tissue because it connects the body in the sense that, you know, blood from the toes goes up to the heart and then pumps through the heart, through the lungs, and then through the brain, and then vice versa, back and forth, back and forth, connecting everything together. However, the reason it's called connective tissue is simply because it meets the criteria of connective tissue. If you think back all the way to chapter 2, when we talk about the different types of tissue, one of those was connective tissue. And we talked about how connective tissues are simply, you know, uh, cells surrounded by an extracellular matrix. That was one of the key characteristics of connective tissue. And if we use that same definition for what we're looking at when we're looking at blood, we see it meets this criteria. We have our cells, which are what are known as our formed elements, surrounded by an extracellular matrix. This extracellular matrix is what we consider our blood plasma. Now normally it's all nice and mixed together like you see here, but when we're trying to get just samples of our blood cells or just samples of the plasma and what's inside the plasma, we put it through this nice little thing called a centrifuge, spins it around, heavier things go to the bottom, the lighter things like the plasma go to the top, and we can divide it and see exactly what our blood is made out of. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. Is we're going to be going through and we're going to be talking about the characteristics of our blood, what makes our blood our blood, and what do we see when we look at our blood. So first of all, let's talk about the characteristics of our blood. So first of all, right off the bat, one of our main characteristics is the color of our blood. And as a surprise as it may be to some of you, our blood is actually red, whether or not it's being touched by the air. I know a lot of you guys have probably heard that before, that your blood is actually blue until it touches the air. However, I'm here to tell you that is absolutely false. And there's actually a great SciShow video about it that I linked down in the description, so you can go check that out. But our blood is always red. Yes, the oxygen may make it change to a brighter red, but nonetheless, it's always going to be red. And the reason for that is because of a special molecule inside of our blood called hemoglobin. And if you remember in the video that you watched yesterday, the guy that was doing the video explained how within this extremely large protein, there are just four atoms of iron. In each molecule, there are 3,032 atoms of carbon, 4,812 atoms of hydrogen, and so on. And then, tucked away down here in the middle of this atomic jungle, are four little iron atoms. Atoms upon which your very life depends. And it's those four atoms of iron to which the oxygen is going to bond to. 
And when this happens, it causes an oxidation reaction, making our blood that much more red. In fact, it's the same exact thing that happens with rust. It's the same principle. That's why rust has that reddish hue to it. It's because of the iron interacting with the oxygen. It's the same thing we see happening in our blood. And so that's why our blood has the color that it does. It's kind of a stickiness to it as well. And uh, the pH, though, in other words, the acidity of it, it's actually fairly neutral. Uh, 7 is a pure neutral on our pH scale, so it's slightly alkaline or basic, but again, not by a whole lot. And this is really important because this helps kind of regulate our entire body's pH, where we're at within that pH scale. And so it tries to keep us balanced everywhere, and it's the same with our body temperature. Now, yes, your blood uh, is going to be a little bit higher of a body temperature, but that also has to deal with uh, what is in our blood, which when I say that, I'm talking about the plasma and specifically the water that makes up that plasma. Water has a, this great ability of being able to retain heat. And so naturally, it's going to retain that body heat even better than some of our other cells can. And so it's going to be warmer than its surroundings in that sense. That's also what helps keep us warm uh, when it's cold outside. And it's also why when it is cold outside, you start to feel that coldness in your fingers and your toes and your extremities first because your body realizes it's cold outside. We got to keep our heart and our other organs warmer. And so it's going to draw more blood in that way because of that body temperature. So those are some basic characteristics of it. Now let's go ahead and let's look at the different uh, units within our blood, starting with our extracellular matrix, the plasma. Our blood plasma, uh, here again it says it's 90% water. This all varies how much you actually find within uh, an individual based off the individual, based off their genetics, things like that. But for the most part, our matrix is just consistent of water and all these different substances that have been dissolved within that water. It's kind of like this uh, sugary, watery solution that we have some cells floating in. And so some of those things include nutrients, which are our sugars, acids, and vitamins, all those important things that our cells are going to be needing and uptaking. In our last chapter, we just talked about you know diabetes, how that deals with the amount of sugar that's in the bloodstream. So that sugar that we see in the bloodstream is going to be considered part of the plasma. Likewise, our electrolytes, that's what salts are. These salts that we're talking about, those are the electrolytes that you guys drink your Gatorades and stuff for. That's going to be found within this plasma, as well as some gases like CO2, carbon dioxide, because again, we're transferring those gases. They're being transported. Likewise, we just finished our chapter on the endocrine system. And we talked about how these hormones use the bloodstream to travel from one place to the other in the body. And so you're going to find a lot of hormones within the blood plasma. And yes, you'll find some waste products that are going to be filtered out through the kidneys and even through the digestive system. But you're also going to find a bunch of proteins. And if you've read anything in the news lately or you've heard anything in the news about COVID-19, you know that they're asking for people to start donating their plasma, especially if they have had COVID-19, because of something unique that's in these people's plasma, which are their antibodies. So you have a lot of different proteins that are inside your blood plasma, some of them being things like albumin, which helps regulate the amount of water that's within our cells and within the bloodstream. You also have special proteins that are going to help with the clotting process when you get a cut, being able to scab that up or being able to let a bruise heal. But also right now what they're looking at are these specific antibodies. Now we have thousands and thousands of antibodies. In fact, your, uh, your dog probably has even more so because of what they expose themselves to. But nonetheless, every time our body's exposed to something new, we develop 
antibodies against these foreign invaders to help our white blood cells and our immune system be able to better identify these nasty things when they come in. And so what's been happening is a lot of these people who have COVID right now, as they're starting to recover from it, what that means is that their immune system was able to get everything in check and it started to make some antibodies against it. So naturally, if somebody who has uh, these COVID-19 antibodies gives their plasma, the scientists can get a hold of those antibodies, give them to somebody else, and once those antibodies are exposed to another person's body, their body will naturally start to make those same antibodies. That's also a reason sometimes you've heard of people allowing a dog to lick a wound. And the reason for that is because the dog's going to have a lot more antibodies than the person will. And so in effect, they say that sometimes licking the wound is going to let their bodies get more antibodies to help protect them. Uh, whether or not there's a lot of science backing that up, I don't know. But that's just another reason. It's because of these antibodies that are found within the blood plasma. And so, again, our blood plasma makes up about 55% of our blood, meaning that the other 45% is what we call our formed elements. So these formed elements are the actual living structures within our extracellular matrix. These are the cells within the matrix, including our red blood cells, white blood cells, and then you have these other cells that are made and they're specifically designed to kind of fall apart and turn into these things called platelets, these cell fragments. And so we're going to go ahead and we're going to look at these each one by one, starting with the red blood cells, also known as the erythrocytes. These are the main cells that we think of when we think of the blood and the bloodstream, because these are the main ones that are going to be performing the task that our blood does. In fact, they outnumber all the other cells a thousand to one. So for every one, white blood cell, you have a thousand of these guys doing the job that they were designed to do, which is to take oxygen from the lungs to everywhere it needs to go in the body. Because every single one of our cells needs oxygen to do cellular respiration. In other words, just to be able to make the energy that they need to survive. And the way these cells do it is really amazing. And again, this is another one of those reasons that I had you guys watch that video yesterday was because I thought they did an excellent job of explaining why our blood cells are shaped the way that they are. And so the video kind of just to recap talks about how you want to take as much oxygen as you can in each cell and be able to get it to the cells as fast as they can. And so naturally, they said in the video, the best shape would be a sphere because you can hold as much, the most of anything in like a sphere. And so they said that would have the most volume. However, when they put it in their little test to see how fast it got absorbed, it started to get absorbed really quickly, but as it started to get to the center, it had a hard time doing so. It started to slow down, which would be a bad thing if we're trying to collect a lot of oxygen to take to places that have been depleted of that oxygen. We want to get it fast. We want to get it like that. And so we need something that's going to be a lot faster than a sphere. And so they started to look at just a disc, a flat disc. And sure enough, that took up all the uh, oxygen, or in their case, the water, super fast. However, the problem that they had was that they sacrificed a lot of volume to get that shape. And so they sent it over to IMB or IBM, which is the, the big computer company, to try and you know, figure out the perfect shape. And IBM came back and told them, you want a biconcave disc. And sure enough, that's exactly what our cells are shaped like. Because the biconcave disc it gives our cells that quick pickup time for the oxygen and the release time for the carbon dioxide 
but it also gives us being that biconcave having that extra area on the outside like on our little donut that we see here that gives it that extra volume for carrying extra oxygen and our these cells do a lot of other things to carry as much oxygen as they can as well uh, for instance they anucleate themselves as they're starting to develop and what this means is that they don't have a nucleus if they don't have a nucleus they don't have any DNA anymore and so they can't do normal cell processes at this point in their life they have determined that all they are going to do is carry oxygen and that's what that hemoglobin is for and like it says here that essentially a bag of hemoglobin that's pretty much it it's like a little donut shaped water balloon filled with hemoglobin now it's only going to be donut shaped if that hemoglobin is formed right let's say something happens to our hemoglobin and the hemoglobin doesn't form properly all of a sudden we get these weird rod shaped hemoglobin proteins instead they're going to lock up and bind together and when that happens our cell no longer has that nice shape that it used to but now it kind of has like a curved uh, crescent or sickle shape and when that sickle shape happens Yes, it can still carry some oxygen, however, not as much. And uh, now that it's not that nice, smooth shape anymore, it's more prone to being getting stuck in certain places and then piling up and starting to form clots, which is never a good thing within the bloodstream. And so that's sickle cell anemia, where you have a low blood uh, count because of all these cells that have been improperly created because the hemoglobin wasn't coded properly and there's a great ted ed video about it and i put that link in the description as well and so last but not least talking about their longevity their lifespan of these cells they wear out within 100 to 120 days and they can't do anything to fix themselves up or to replicate themselves because they have a nucleate themselves they no longer have that dna and so after just so long of use they eventually wear out and uh, new cells take their place now it says 100 to 120 days this doesn't mean like every four months on the day you know all those all your body cells die or all your blood cells die and get replaced no they're constantly being replaced but you know those cells have about that long of a lifespan and when those cells do die, they have to go somewhere. And in fact, it's the reason why when you decide to defecate, our fecal matter has a brown color to it. That brown color is actually all of your red blood cells who made the ultimate sacrifice to give you the oxygen that you need until they wore out. And that's why your poop is brown. So there's your fun fact for the day. So leukocytes, uh, you're probably more familiar hearing them referred to as our white blood cells. And these are different than the red blood cells in the sense that they're not going to be carrying oxygen. There's not going to be nearly as many of them. And they are going to be fully formed cell because of the job that they have to do. And so these guys, sometimes they're going to res be responding to chemicals. Sometimes they're going to be responding to these things known as antigens. And so if you've heard anything about like the coronavirus lately, they've been talking about uh, it's called a coronal virus because it has like this coronal shape, this crown on the outside. That crown on the outside of the coronavirus is what's known as its antigens. And so our body looks for these different little antigens and if it sees antigens that it knows it's like okay you're good keep going but if it sees an antigen that it doesn't recognize it says hold up you don't belong and it starts to attack it this is the same thing that happens with blood transfusions in our different blood types and i'm not going to get too deep into blood types here uh, there's another great ted ed about it that i linked down in the description you guys can go check that one out but it talks about how we have four basic blood types. You're either type A, type B, type AB, 
or O. And there are even variations within that with us, another antigen known as the RH antigen. And let's assume for a second that you are a type A blood. And so that means that you have the type A antigens. And so let's say you need a blood transfusion. You get that blood from somebody who's a type B, which means that they have the type B antigens. Well, your white blood cells, these leukocytes, are going around looking for things that don't belong. And remember, you are a type A, so they're looking for type A antigens to say, okay, you're good. All of a sudden, they come across these new blood cells that are type B, and they don't belong, and so they start to attack them. And then you get this process known as coagulation that happens, which is kind of where it just kind of gets all ooey-gooey and not very good. And it's not as smooth as it should be and it starts to clot the arteries and veins and it's just not a good thing and that's why it's super important as well that you make sure when you're getting a blood transfusion that the donor and the recipient match up on blood types and so again that ted ed video that's down in the description that explains blood types a whole lot better let's finish up with our leukocytes so what we see here uh, this little chart that's from your textbook actually just shows you the different types of leukocytes. I say white blood cells, but you guys know that there's more than one type of white blood cell. We can sometimes talk about them as like the uh, B blood cells or different things like that. Uh, but there's different categories. There are some that are known as granulocytes and agranulocytes. Granulocytes, as their name kind of implies, they have these little like granules inside these little dot type things and so these are your neutrophils and your eosinophils and your basophils those are all your granulocytes your a granulocytes include your lymphocytes and your monocytes and these are our primary different types of uh, leukocytes our leukocytes generally again relatively small levels compared to red blood cells uh, around 4,000 to 100 or from 4,000 to 11,000 cells per milliliter which means that you know if you have a milliliter of blood which isn't a lot you should see approximately 400,000 red blood cells and within those 400,000 red blood cells you're going to see 4,000 white blood cells or you know 11,000 whatever around that number if you start to see more than these 11,000 you may be in the process of having leukocytosis which isn't always a bad thing because what can happen in leukocytosis is sometimes it's just your body producing more white blood cells than you normally need because you're fighting off an infection. And so sometimes doctors will ask you the weird question, what color is your snot? Uh, if you're sick, or they'll say, what color is your mucus? Something like that. And what they're getting at is if it's, depending on the color, if it's clear, white, green, yellow, brown, uh, one of those colors is going to let them know how many white blood cells have started to die off in this process of fighting your infection? If it is a real infection, you know, are you producing an excess amount of blood, white blood cells? And that's the reason why. So, like, if you have clear snot or clear mucus, then they know it's probably just allergies because you're not really producing any more blood cells to help fight it off. And so it's just normal mucus. But if you start to have white or yellow or brown, then they know that there is some leukocytosis going on, that there are a lot more cells than generally are, and so they're helping fight off an infection. Sometimes, though, this can also get out of hand where you can have too many of these cells, and so the immune system isn't able to function properly. It's not able to identify the threats as it should. And so that can also be uh, a danger. Likewise, uh, you can have uh, leukopenia, which is 
the exact opposite where you don't have enough to fight off infections and so this can leave you uh, you vulnerable to different infections like COVID-19 even the flu and just normal infections because you don't have the right amount of blood cells to fight off the infection and sometimes this can even be onset by leukemia I'm sure you probably thought of leukemia when we start talking about leukocytes because it has that same beginning. And leukemia is a cancer of the blood, and it's specifically of these white blood cells. So what happens is they start to divide and multiply, which you would think would be a good thing. However, these cells that are dividing and multiplying are mutated, and they're not a fully developed cell. So they're basically a useless cell that's just kind of hanging around there, and what can happen is it can start to deteriorate the overall level of the other white blood cells that are there. And it's just not a good thing overall. And then last but not least are platelets. Uh, these platelets are just simply little chunks of cells. That's uh, one way you could think about it. And what happens is we have these specific types of cells within our blood that are actually made and designed to simply rupture and when they do instead of just deteriorating and letting those pieces be dissolved they stay broken up and they kind of seal themselves off and just turn into these little bits and pieces that float around and you might think to yourself why in the world would you need something like that and the best illustration I can think of is uh, a clogged toilet. I'm sure there's a better definition or illustration, but just follow me with this for a second. Uh, if there's nothing in the toilet, you know, the water flows nice and smooth. However, if things get stuck in the toilet, all of a sudden that water can't go anywhere. Well, think about your skin. Think about your blood. It's uh, flowing through your arteries and your veins and your capillaries, but all of a sudden you get a cut. And now that blood is wanting to go somewhere. Well, just like in your toilet, that water wants to go somewhere. And if you put things in the toilet to clog it, that water can't go anywhere. Likewise, you know, we have that cut in our blood or our arteries now, or the veins, whatever you want to think of. We have that cut, and all of a sudden that blood is going to start going somewhere where we don't want it to. And so, just like you know, little Timmy might have clogged the toilet, so now our platelets are going to clog that opening so we don't lose any more blood. And you're also going to get some of those proteins that are in the plasma that are going to come along and help with that clotting process. And that's the basic reason for having these platelets, these thrombocytes, you could call them. And that is kind of the basics of our blood in a nutshell. Again, if we have more time, there's so much I would love to talk about with you guys. But you also know how much I love my TED Ed videos. And there are a ton of TED Ed videos about the blood. And so I put a link to all those in the description. If you have any questions, let me know and remind. And until next time, I will talk to you guys later.